Hello and before we start the next episode I would just like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's watched, subscribed, commented, recommended me to others. I am overwhelmed. I've now reached over a thousand subscribers which is so far beyond my wildest dreams. If my wildest dreams were here that number is a far dot on the horizon. Extended metaphor. Slightly strange but you know what I mean. Just thank you everyone. I know that there are some people that have suggested me to others so big thanks to Rebecca and Stephanie of The Mean Girls. You are fab. You really make me smile. Uh, to Shauna of Shauna Stitches, to Chevy Rell, to Amy of The Stranded Podcast. Just big big thanks to everyone. Uh, my flabber is ghasted and my gob is smacked and I've just realised that if you're not British you've no idea what I've just said but I'm stunned by the numbers that I've had so thank you all very very much um, I've tried to respond to every comment that I've had if I haven't responded to you, apologies I have tried to keep up with them uh, yeah it's just been completely overwhelming and I'm thrilled I don't know what else to say so as a, as a little thank you for a big thing I'm doing a couple of giveaways which I'll put details in um, later in this podcast but yeah just an enormous Thanks so much. It means a huge amount. I'm just sitting here talking about knitting and you've come along and said, yeah, I'll listen to that. So amazing. Thank you very much. That is all genuinely heartfelt stuff, but it's not what you're expecting. So we'll get back to the world weary bitterness and sarcasm that you've come to know. Welcome to episode four of the Not Quite Enough Yarn podcast. My name's Leslie. This is a monthly podcast from the south coast of the UK and it's mostly about knitting, crochet, general yarn craft. It's about my bid to use up some of my extensive stash. I have more than two cupboards worth but rarely enough for a whole garment or a whole item. So that's why it's called Not Quite Enough Yarn, because there's normally something that I have to add in from elsewhere. Um, I usually record this throughout the month and then upload last weekend of the month as a rule. And I'm really grateful for you stopping by. So whether you're a new viewer or a returning viewer, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Uh, before I move on, I have been asked to show a picture or to show the while I'm waiting blanket. Uh, as you'll see in this podcast whilst I'm sitting in the car waiting for appointments I tend to work on small projects and you'll see one of those later. This is since I finished the following blanket which I will show you now and it was called the while I'm blank while I'm waiting because all of these hexagons were made in the car. It took me several years uh, but it was a small, easy to remember, very portable project. I was using up a lot of acrylic yarn and decided to make a blanket out of it. Now the piece at the top with the kind of Celtic-y knot type of pattern is, oh it's so me. For some reason, and I like to think it's because I'm a genius, ugh, um, I wanted to make a dressing gown, house coat type of thing. And nothing wrong with that in theory, but for some reason I thought a 500 gram cone of four ply yarn would be enough to do that in single crochet, single crochet um, US term, double crochet UK term. Quite why I thought that would be enough, I have absolutely no idea. It clearly wasn't. That piece that you see at the top of the blanket um, used up a good proportion of the 500 grams as you can imagine. Having made it and realised that yes that would make a lovely base of a house coat or dressing gown but it was going to be very stripy thereafter which wasn't the look I was going for. I didn't unpick it obviously I'd put a lot of time and effort into it and I thought I will reuse that. So I decided to make the blanket around it and use it as the, the headpiece. This did mean that some of the hexagons I had to make wedges 
uh, rather than hexagon pieces so I'd do a half or a three quarter or just a wedge or two to make the pieces fit around it but it's an incredibly warm very heavy blanket which lives on my spare bed which means most of the time it has piles of laundry on it that I need to iron and haven't got round to yet but it's a, a project that I'm very happy with that's that, so I'm glad I've answered that question. If you do have any questions, please do add them in the comments box below. Or if you're on Ravelry, and on Ravelry I am known as Lala, which is spelt L-A-H-L-A-H, -L -A -H, um, I've opened a Not Quite Enough Yarn podcast group. So by all means, join, be lovely to have you along, introduce yourself, chat along, any questions, please do put them in there. To get hold of me or see what I'm up to on other social media, I'm Knitting or Death on both Instagram and Twitter, but realistically I'm on Ravelry more often than I should be, but certainly more often than the other two platforms. The other reason for starting the uh, the Ravelry group is that I'm going to do a giveaway. I'm actually going to do two. There'll be details later in the podcast. One will be something that you can do on Ravelry and the other will be one that you can enter on YouTube. So in theory, you could win twice. And if you do, great. I'm not going to judge you. Marvellous. Um, yeah, so that will come later in the podcast. And yeah, I think that's it for all the kind of administration notices and introduction and stuff. So let's get on with some deeply important and valuable knitting content. In the next two sections I shall be mostly caressing polystyrene heads. I like to have something in my hands, which is possibly why I'm a knitter, and when I've got something in my hands I have to fiddle, so uh, I shall stroke hats. Uh, this is the homeless man's hat that I made. I don't know which particular homeless man, but hopefully it will be someone. Or woman, of course. This is a gender neutral podcast. Um, yeah, so made it whilst I was in the car out of double knitting weight scraps. Started from the centre point, increased till I got to the stitch numbers that I wanted. I think it was about 112, something like that. Then just knitted straight and added a rib, as demonstrated and modelled here by Bert. We love Bert. Now I did make a bit of a mistake, um, it has, over emphasise that because the way I'm taking it off, but it does have a little bit of a point. Um, yeah, it looks a bit like a an old fashioned scout hat or a Canadian Mounties hat. And even when I put it flat down, we do have a bit of a nipple there, which I don't think we really want. But hopefully it will flatten out with use. I basically de increased too, too regularly. Um, so it made it a, a pointed shape rather than a flatter one. So to rectify that, I unpicked a few stitches from the beginning, which is always a bit more laborious than unpicking from the end because you have to pull through each loop, but obviously there weren't many stitches involved. Threaded the yarn through the live stitches, pulled it tight and wove in the end. So hopefully this will keep someone warm who needs it in cold weather. And I'm now on to the twiddle muff, which you'll see in the next thrilling part of this podcast. Actually, not the next part. The next part is another hat. And because I'm not very good at filming these things, um, apologies that at one point I was kind of waving the polystyrene head around rather than caressing it in a motherly fashion. And it has made the light go quite light and dark. Um, so if you're sensitive to that, apologies to everyone, but if you're sensitive to that, Please do fast forward any bits where you can see me holding a head uh, because I wouldn't want to make anyone feel unwell. Or at least any more unwell than they, I normally do. So yes, yeah, so we're on a bit of a hat tip at the moment. And like I say, hopefully this will do some good for someone who needs it when the cold weather comes again. Thanks, Bert. Have a finished object. Ethel. It appears to be a bit scarred actually, I'm not sure what she's been up to. Is modelling a hat that I made yesterday. I wanted a, a new dog walking hat. I have a, a dog walking hat and it's machine knit and I bought it and it strikes me that as a knitter that's really 
not the done thing. Uh, I like to have a, a light coloured dog walking hat because uh, if I'm out dusk or dawn when it's not very bright, the lighter the better. And I was after a brimmed hat, I had a look on Ravelry and just looking through the patterns there and it said that there was one in my library. I thought, oh, where's that then? Well, it's in this book. 24 hour knitting projects by Rita Weiss. Weiss? I don't know. Um, this was actually bought for me a few years ago by a friend and it, I always find it interesting when non-knitters buy gifts. I love it because they're, they're never things I would choose for myself but um, but they're usually interesting. And this I looked at at the time and thought oh that's nice and it went on the shelf and it stayed there ever since but yesterday I made a pattern from it for the first time. Um, slightly concerned that in the pattern and this is called Forecast for Fall and it's by uh, Sandy Scoville. It says that the estimated time to make is about seven hours. I'm not the world's fastest knitter and I did this in an evening so I'm not sure where they get the seven hours from but uh, let's not worry too much. Um, fairly straightforward as you can see. I made a couple of modifications. It's knit flat and sewn together which is what I did, that's fine. Um, I didn't have the correct yarn, not surprising. I added a bit of rib here just to make sure that the fit was snug. Uh, I didn't want it blowing away in a high wind. So a bit of rib which is hidden by the, the brim. That is when I fold it up. Um, so just to make sure that it, it has a good fit to it. The yarn I used is the the brim is made from Wendy Ida and it is as soft as it looks. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's an acrylic nylon mix, so we're not talking luxurious fibres, but it is beautifully soft. I did have a bit of a moment of crisis because I I was knitting it and I thought, oh, this is so soft, it's lovely, it, it feels like the dog. And then I thought, it looks like the dog too. And I'm not one of those people who does the dress up as your dog thing. That's really not me. So I'm a bit dubious that I appear to be wearing my dog's pelt if I wear this hat. But um, if the dog doesn't mind. Or oh, talking of the dog, we have renegotiated terms and um, she will appear in future episodes. I mentioned the word biscuit and this was the reaction I got. She's such a diva. So Wendy Ida for the, the fluff. The rest is John Arbon Knit by Numbers. And I got this. Oh, now they're in Rest the Tale. Are you sitting comfortably, boys and girls? Then let's begin. Once upon a time, there was a knitting magazine in the UK called Yarn Forward. And verily, it was good. Actually, it was good. Um, Knitting magazines need to understand, that the editors need to understand their markets and some go for very high-end stuff in terms of big name designers, some go for new innovative designs, some are much more, are aimed at a much more simple market, I mean the type of designs, not the knitters, hopefully. Um, so, you know, they, they offer stuff that would be suitable for beginners, uh, relatively straightforward, easy projects. Yarn Forward had a nice middle ground. Most of the patterns in it had something interesting, a bit of texture, a bit of technique, a bit of shaping, something that elevated a bit from the basic, but it didn't make it too avant-garde and too weird and wonderful. So I really liked it. and. Um, did a couple of designs for them. The people running Yarn Forward magazine, and they also introduced Inside Crochet, which is still going, although it's subsequently been bought by another uh, publishing house, were massively over-trading. Um, that's the headline on that, yeah. They, they were using any funds they had to put into the next venture and the next venture and the next venture. And um, it all started to go horribly wrong. The alarm bell sounded for the <laughs> most stupid of reasons. 
they accepted three of my designs at once and I thought well that's not right <laughs> not that there was anything wrong with the designs they were fine um, but it's unusual to have three accepted by the same magazine at the same time at the level that I design at I'm not a, a prolific designer at all I know some people um, come out with a lot of things and they have a lot of test knitters and it's all grand uh, that's not me that's not what I do um, so the fact that they accepted three at once was odd. Also, other magazines, they won't have more than one design from a particular designer in an issue, which makes sense. You don't want it to turn into the, the Leslie show or the whoever show. Um, so, yeah, they accepted three, and I thought, this is a bit odd. And the yarn came through. There was yarn support offered by the, the spinners and the dyers and so forth. And I thought, OK, and I started doing a bit of research. Now, at the same time, another designer um, had put a post up on Ravelry saying, is anyone having trouble getting paid? And at that point, I started looking back through my records and realised that I had a couple of previous designs that I hadn't been paid for. Now, when you bear in mind that at this time, I was working for an invoice finance company, I really should have kept on <laughs> on top of that a bit better. I used to spend my life in credit control. I spent time as an auditor. I remember talking to one client saying, your credit control systems, you're very good at the credit. So having looked back and realised that I had a couple of invoices, or well, three invoices, I think they hadn't been paid, I started to think, hmm, this is interesting. For a little while I carried on, I thought, well, the yarn's arrived, I'll see how the land lies. And I did my tension uh, swatches and things like that. Then it became fairly obvious that the whole thing was, was getting into a bigger and bigger hole. And I thought, I am going to end up being in a bit of a pickle here. So I rang them and said you know I've got these outstanding invoices and in the end I thought well I'll basically do what most businesses would do which was put you on stop so I said look I've got three designs in the pipeline until my invoices are paid I'm not going to do them and the person I was speaking to really understood she wasn't one of the people running the magazine she was an employee she was great actually really lovely person and she understood entirely. She managed to get one of the invoices paid, so I did get a bit of money through. Um, and, you know, I'm very fortunate that any design work I do is extra. It's bunce money. It's not. I'm not reliant on it. I have another job. Like I say at the time, my other job was invoice finance. Hmm. Um, and the other thing with, with not keeping on top of getting paid for these invoices is the length of time the whole process takes. So we're currently in April. If I were to submit a design at the moment, it would probably be for a December issue of a magazine. So I would put a design in, say it got approved, yarn would come through. I might send the, the finished item and the pattern off June, and I'd send the invoice at the same time. But the invoice doesn't get paid until the month after the magazine is published. Um, that's how it's worked with the magazines that I've done stuff for. I'm assuming that's kind of fairly standard. So it's easy to lose track because you're not keeping things fresh in your head. You know, I, I was looking back at invoices that were several months old and weren't even overdue at that point because the magazines hadn't been published. So I, um, I rang them, I got some money but then it all went a bit Pete Tong again. So I gave them a deadline and said, look, and until, unless I get paid by X date, I won't be submitting these designs. Date, the deadline came and went. So I contacted the yarn companies. And there were three involved, and all three, without fail, were brilliant. Because I contacted them, and I said, look, I've had this yarn from you because of non-payment, I'm not in a position to do the designs. I would like to return the yarn to you. However, I have eaten into one ball because I've done a, a swatch and let me know how much that costs and I will pay you for that because I figured, you know, I've, I've got this ball of yarn sitting in my stash now. Um, 
And all three of them came back and said, thank you very much. I guess perhaps some people would just say, oh, yeah, thanks very much. But that wasn't me. Um, keep the one that you've eaten into. Just send us the rest back and that'll be great. So that's what I did. So that's why I ended up with a ball of John Arban Knit by Numbers yarn, which is lovely. It's really nice yarn, and I keep meaning to buy some more, but not this year, not until the cupboards are with space in them. Um, so yes, I used the uh, John Arban yarn. Now, I was probably out of pocket by about £400, because the, the magazine went bust, the company running the magazine went bust, um, there was no money to pay creditors. I was an unsecured creditor, so a long way down the pecking order. Pfft, I was never going to see that money again. I was annoyed. Of course I was annoyed. I was mostly annoyed with myself for not having kept on top of the invoices. But like I say, there were long time scales and I'd just taken my eye off the ball for a while. Um, so I was cross for a while and then I thought, well, life's too short to be cross. Yes, it's annoying to kiss goodbye to 400 quid, but, you know, I've wasted more for less, I'm sure. And also, looking at it longer term, through the contacts I made, through doing the patterns for them, I then did some designs later for a couple of books, which I probably have here. She said putting her tea down precariously. So I've got, I think, three patterns in this book and one in this book so oh i've got a tag on that one so that's probably going to show you what the pattern is oh yes there it is there we go so that was a big thick chunky crochet item um yeah so i in the long term i made more than i lost because of other work that came my way and the contacts made and the person involved in these led me on to someone else so I, I'm not going to get too um, upset about it, but it was just a, a really enlightening experience and very disappointing because you think, oh, this is knitting. Everyone's meant to be lovely. Sorry, I just judded the camera there. And sadly, not everyone's lovely. How very naive of me to think they might be. Um, so very disappointing, but I'm not going to worry about it. The person who ran the magazine, overtraded the magazine, now does other stuff. She doesn't get involved in the knitting community anymore, funnily enough. She has a fairly toxic reputation. And that was actually another dilemma, because I thought, if I go ahead with these um, patterns and they get published, am I then being tarred by association? Because this magazine was not paying its designers. Am I sitting there saying, oh, that's OK, that's fine. No, because we're all mugs. So I'm glad I took the actions I did. I was disappointed that I, I lost some money, but I wasn't the only one, and I certainly didn't lose the most. I know there are some designers who had a lot of unpaid invoices. Another thing that was a bit irritating is a lot of those designs were then sold on, without our knowledge, to another company and published in a, a magazine, I think, in Canada. Make sure you know what you're signing. Make sure you know what you're letting yourself in for. Um, they hadn't done anything contravening the contract terms because certain rights had been passed on. But it was still a bit galling. And also I found it a bit frustrating because if one is putting together a designing CV, you'd want to know where your stuff is published because it's another publication to add to your your list of items. So... That was a bit galling. Um, all my designs that I have rights to are free. And if anyone's ever interested in any of my designs, any that have been published in magazines, I then offer for free once the rights pass back to me. The ones in the books, uh, they come under different contracts and the rights are passed over to the publishers. So I have had people say to me, you know, how can I get hold of this? And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything because I no longer own the right to the pattern. Um, and that was, a, I went into it eyes open. I knew what I was taking on and I was happy with that. But with the magazines, the rights pass back after six months a year. And I've got a, a Google page that I put them on. It's all accessible via the Ravelry. Um, and yeah, so if anyone wants any of my patterns, um, they're all there. Help yourselves, booty boots. But yes, yeah, a bit of a, an adventure. 
And all this because I made a hat. Hmm, I can ramble. This is clear. Now the hat is, it's okay. Um, it's made flat and sewn together. Actually, my seaming isn't too bad. It's fairly acceptable. Um, I made it top down when the pattern was initially written for bottom up. The reason why I did that is because I wasn't using the recommended yarn. Um, I don't even know if that's still available. It's quite an old book. Um, I wanted to make sure that it fitted. So, And it does. The only thing I would say is I would make it a little longer. I did add a little bit of length to it as well as the ribbing. But I would make it a longer. So yes, I think if I were to make it again, I would make it longer. And I would try not to make it look like a three-year-old poodle cross with an attitude problem. Today I've been on an adventure. I've been over to Eastbourne where there was a fibre festival. I believe it's been held before but not something I've been to. The footage I'm showing you at the moment is a shot of part of the journey there by train and it's one of my favourite train journeys and you're probably looking at it thinking well so what it's just a fence and some rocks but we can see the sea. I live very close to the coast and I love this journey because it takes us along past beach huts and good views of the beach. Here you can see the sign and you can see one of the problems with the Fibre Festival upstairs today. So not the most accessible of venues. Um, it's a small venue and it's just a bit of a shame that it was held upstairs. Um, I have a friend who couldn't go because she has a mobility problem so that's a real shame. There were a few stalls outside, including this one, Romney Marsh Walls. Um, I'm sure that at least some of you will have heard of Romney Marsh Sheep. And that's about sort of an hour away from where I live in the other direction to where the Fibre Festival was. Um, the sheep are very hardy. And if you've ever been to Romney Marsh, you'll understand why. Goodness, it's bleak out there. Very picturesque, very striking, but you don't want to get stuck out there on a windy day. This is a stall from Isle Inspired Yarn, very nice lady. It's all naturally dyed yarns. And one of the giveaway prizes that I'll be offering up was bought from this lady, dyed with onion skins, a lovely sort of orangey, yellowy sort of colour. Uh, she has an Etsy shop. I'll put the details in the show notes. As I say, it was a very small festival. Um, probably about 20 stalls and not all yarn related. Um, there were some people with items that they'd sewn. There was a lady with a loom, um, some needle felting going on. So a few bits and pieces. And it was a pleasant way to spend. I think I spent about half an hour there. So not at all massive. But uh, you like to support local things and hopefully it can grow and be in a venue that isn't upstairs, hopefully. This was my journey home. Home is the sailor, home from the sea, the yarn hunter, home from the hill. Well, here's a nice surprise. It's a sunny day in the cemetery proof that I'm in the cemetery. Have a few minutes before my next appointment. Having finished the hat for homeless people, or a homeless person, I don't expect people to share it, um, I'm back on the twiddle muffs and I thought I'd try something different or something new for twiddle muffs for me and that's a corner to corner affair. I'm still using the green, the, uh, the magic ball is much smaller than it was but still using it at the moment. So not all of this will be green, but uh, a fair proportion of it will be. I've used corner to corner once before. I made a hand towel out of scraps, cotton scraps I had, 
and really like the way I was the way it came out. I think it appeals to me because each section is finished quickly. Um, so it feels as though progress is being made. It's um, similar to Entrelac in that way. And I guess it's a kind of mini Entrelac. Um, I did an Entrelac cardigan once. Another tale. I made an Entrelac cardigan and submitted the design in the usual form. And here's the item that I made. I'll put a picture up here. This was a photograph I took at home before I sent it off to the magazine. When it arrived, they felt it didn't really match the styling of the magazine, the kind of vision they had for that particular edition. So they made this alteration. I wasn't thrilled. I was quite upset. Um, I really didn't like the shape of it. Um, if they'd wanted a sleeveless vest, I'd have made a sleeveless vest. But what could I do? It had already been published. Um, I ran into the editor at a, a yarn show not long after. And she said, oh, have you seen it? Do you like it? Said, no, sorry, I don't. But <sighs> there was nothing I could do by that point. I would have preferred they'd spoken to me about it, showed me a picture. And I think I would have happily said, uh, yeah, put it in, but don't put my name on it. Because I felt that strongly about the way it looked. But the situation was taken out of my hand and in the great scheme of things, no one got hurt. You know, it was just very disappointing for me. The pattern, I think, is on my free patterns page, if anyone is interested. But yes, that was uh, crochet on Trelac using double crochet, US single crochet. I've subsequently used that for a baby blanket and I'll put a picture up here. Uh, that was kind of a bit easier to do because uh, the colours were the same where the seams matched. So uh, you didn't have to try and work backwards, which is what you do in the cardigan, to give it a smoother line where the colours uh, cross. I keep having ideas about crochet on vlac and I should design stuff and put things together. Whether I will or not is unknown because uh, me and time management isn't, we don't always get along well. But we shall see. Hope springs. In the meantime, this twiddle muff will be made corner to corner. And hopefully it will finish quite quickly. I'm not putting the texture in this. I did try on a couple of the squares. Um, they just looked a bit odd. Didn't really show up with a lot of uh, three-dimensional texture. So in this case, I'm just going to work it straight. I might make some pieces and thread them through the gaps between the the squares you can see a little little hole there um, and sort of make some ribbons to thread through as a piece of interest but we'll see how the mood takes it's friday and the sun is glorious sitting in the car sadly i don't think it's due to last and i believe we're forecast rain for tomorrow that's england in the spring for you Hope you have warmth and sunshine wherever you are. Right, there's been some stash acquisition, but I swear it's not my fault. Genuinely, I have not bought anything. I haven't actually bought any yarn since November. But it manages to find its way into my stash. As they used to say in an old British TV sitcom, oh dear, how sad, never mind. But I have more stash of varying quantities and colours and delights, which I will show you. The first two bits of stash have come from magazines. Inside Crochet Magazine have their 100th issue this month. And they sent a nice pack of stuff. There was some... Tapestry needles, some stitch markers, a crochet hook, and a little ball of yarn. And quite often the yarn given away with magazines is um, not great, to be honest. But this is yarn and colours. It's 100% mercerised cotton. Only 25 metres. It's quite a sweet little colour. I hope that's uh, showing up okay. So 25 metres is a livable amount. My next 
magazine related stash acquisition uh, was partly my fault in that I hadn't I'd let my subscription to a magazine slide and um, hadn't realised thought I'd sent a check off and hadn't and all this sort of thing so when I realised and sent it to you I got treated as a new subscriber and that meant I got a pattern book of about 10-15 baby patterns and three balls of baby yarn so we have they're all Sir Dirt Snuggly two balls of grey I'm not sure if that colour is really showing up it's a nice sort of dark sort of bluey grey and a sort of natural cream whitey sort of colour um, it's 100% acrylic but it does live up to its name I think it's 100% acrylic Oh, I lied. 45% acrylic, 55% nylon. Um, but it is a soft yarn, and it is one I quite like using. So, uh, sorry, not sorry with the yarn acquisition there. And the final one is my beloved husband, Richard, who has been in France. We have a very talented nephew who's extremely good at golf. And representing his country for the first time this week, we're very proud. Uh, he was playing in France, just outside Paris. And the lovely Richard went to France. And I had a look on Ravelry and I couldn't see any yarn shops near where he was staying. But after, you know, we've been married 23 years, it's been a fair amount of training. He, he managed to sniff them out. So he got me three balls of a yarn called Fonty and it's a merino yarn it's a four ply fingering weight it just says um 100% la superwash uh but as it's called bb merinos merino merino um then that's what i'm going to assume it, it is and certainly it fills it it's a nice sort of soft yarn so we have a lovely red we have a lovely blue now he is a supporter of crystal palace football club and these two together make their colors but he has redeemed himself with a lovely purple as well. So three balls of four ply weight merino yarn in three great colours. This does mean that my stash used so far this year exceeds, sorry, my stash used is less than stash gained. We're beginning to see where the problem lies, aren't we? But um, we'll get there. And these are very soft and very lovely. I normally record most of the podcast in my office upstairs, but this is actually where I do a lot of my knitting. So it makes sense to give you a roundup of works in progress here. Roundup of works in progress sounds like it needs a sort of quiz show type theme tune. Ba -ba -ba -ba. But let's not. Uh, yeah, so this is where I do most of my knitting. My notions are all here. Um, boxes with different projects in. Before I go into works in progress I have a couple of finished items. I completed a second woven sh scarf. Scarf? Splendid. And it's much neater than the previous one. It's not perfect but perfect is an unattainable ideal. Not for humans. Yeah right. Um, yeah, so that's that. It's made out of Hayfield Spirit, which is a commercial yarn. I got it in Hobbycraft. I was very kindly given a voucher and I'd bought some bits and pieces and I had a couple of pounds left on it and I saw this yarn and I thought, well, those colours are nice. And as we know, traditionally, this is the way I always brought yarn, bought yarn rather. Um, but yeah, they're working pretty well. It's quite a, quite a range of colours in there. I added a bit of yellow plain acrylic in the warp at the edges because I was worried I wouldn't have enough and also to finish it off I did the same when weaving. I misjudged it slightly, there are 345 metres in the scarf. Had there been 400 I could have carried on going, as it was I ran out so it's a slightly shorter scarf than I would have initially chosen. and. Of course you warp it first and then weave it so I had quite a lot of warp that I didn't use because I'd run out of the yarn but it's still a, a long enough scarf and perfectly acceptable for general usage 
Also, I finished it off with a, a, an edging technique I haven't tried before, which ties these small numbers of sh uh, strands together. You do it sewing through with a tapestry needle, and that's created quite a nice, neat edge. So I'm very happy with the way that's turned out. So this is for the craft fair that I hope to do later in the year. Um, and hopefully someone will like it. The other project I've got, you may have seen on Instagram, if you follow me on that. I'm not terribly active on it, but uh, just in case. And this is not a police truncheon, as it looks. It's where I keep my drumsticks. In the next month or so, there will be a lot about drumming. Um, where I live, there is a lot around May Day, a lot of celebration. And I've recently joined a drumming group, hence the sticks. And they dress up in black and red. And come May Day, they dress up in green. You will see all this stuff later. Brace yourselves, it'll be in the, the next podcast. And that's for my drum, that actually attaches to my drum. Also on my drum, which used to be blue, but obviously I've decorated it, I have the first of what will be many skulls. So I hope you can see that. The whole costume thing goes towards a kind of steampunk, slightly gothic weird. It does get a bit weird, but in a fun way, hopefully not in a scary way. Hopefully. Apologise for my hair today. It's, it's lovely warm weather here, which I'm not complaining about. But it does make the hair go a bit floofy. And also it makes my nose bright red. I have very mild rhinophyma, which is an inflammation of the sweat glands on the nose. Could that be any sexier, I ask you. So come the summer, it goes bright red and is prone to spots. It's just such a treat. Um, on the plus side, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. It does mean that we don't have to put the lights on for a long time because I can light my knitting through the glow from my nose so we're all good. Now I said once before that I write my projects in a list and I rattle through them, um, do them in a row to just tick them off and so I'll go through in the same order. So the first is the four ply cardigan, this is the panel jacket by Carol Lapin and this is the second panel. The first is currently blocking. I'm making this in Aracania Ranco and the edging is in a King Cole yarn and it's proving to be a very useful project. There's a little bit of shaping down here which is waist shaping as the panels sew together for the jacket uh, but actually this is proving to be a very useful project in the same way that a lot of people like to have some vanilla socks on the go that it's an easy pick up portable, don't have to think about it type project. I'm not a sock knitter, so this is doing the same job for me. So that's panel two of the panel jacket. Next project is something you haven't seen before and I will go into more detail later, but it's another large Faroese construction shawl, much plainer than the last one. And the yarn is a similar colour to the one I had to throw away, which started this whole not using, not buying yarn thing. Um, it's a John Arben yarn. I will go into details perhaps in the next podcast when I talk about that. But that's project number two. Number three. Ah, number three on my list. I've actually abandoned. It's the Elizabethan bag, and the fact that I've abandoned it is no reflection on Mrs. Buttons or her pattern, um, both of which are truly wonderful. It was just the wrong project at the wrong time in the wrong yarn for me. So really lovely patterns on it, lovely yarn, and in a way that was my problem. I was using a 100% alpaca, and the bag is just a sling a folder in it, carry it around type bag, not a not a cared for bag, if you see what I mean. It's more of a kind of practical tote type of thing. And the yarn seemed too nice for that. I did talk about the possibility of making a cushion instead, but it wouldn't really go with any of the rooms in the house. So I just found that I wasn't 
doing it. Um, and every time it came up on the list, I was a bit sort of, oh, don't fancy that. And nothing to do with the pattern. It was great. Just I couldn't feel the usefulness of what I was making. So I've decided to unpick it. I was taking so long. It was a knit long. And I was already calling it the late Elizabethan bag. And I was just delaying and delaying. And it was going to become Victorian or Georgian or something by the time I'd finished. So decided to unpick it. I will use the yarn for stranded work because I like the way that the two colours went together. And I have an idea for some stranded mittens. I've seen a pattern that I like that I'll go for. Foolishly, before I'm picking it, I didn't measure my tension. I didn't do a gauge. I didn't take the measurements for my gauge, which is a mistake, but never mind. We, we live, we learn. Or we live, at least. So that one uh, has gone by the wayside, sadly. The next project is the cardigan that I've shown you before, which is using all of the cones of lace weight yarn. So I've got four different colours worked with this mohair mix. It's drops pattern called Come Here. I've modified it to make it an asymmetrical cardigan and I'm getting on with it okay. As you can see I've divided for the sleeves and I'm working on one of the sleeves. I tend to do the sleeves first uh, partly because sleeves can get a bit monotonous so I like to kind of plough through them and also given that I don't know how the colours are going to work out in terms of when I run out of yarns and bring other ones in if I do the sleeves first they're both the same and then the rest will just be stripes on the way down so liking the way the colours all work together it's it's mild and then some but in not too leery a way hopefully so that's plodding along rather nicely the next project is the Divi sweater, which is a pattern by Caron Burnett, that lot. I have finished the back and I'm now on the front and working my way up and I will soon be at the point where I divide for the placket neck. So this is coming along well. I took it along to a knitting group on Wednesday, so got a bit done then. It's quite a, a a sociable knitting pattern you can chat with it because it's only although it looks as if it could be complicated three rows are knit purl knit and then the fourth row is the one with the pattern so you don't and even that pattern's very simple so it's it's not one of these terribly complicated don't talk to me I'm knitting type patterns so that's working well the red is Aracania Ulmo and then I've got a couple of drops Muscat for the white and the beige. I know I'm rattling through these, but I will go through in detail more when I come across them for the when you come across them for the first time, or obviously when I finish them, if that glorious day comes. Me curtain for me downstairs doodah. I've had to abandon it for the moment. It's it's on hold. I've reached an en passe because rather embarrassingly, I can't find any more of the cotton yarn. So I've used up the balls I was using and I can't find any more and that's a bit embarrassing. There was a time when I'd have just gone out and got another ball of crochet cotton but this is the year of not buying yarn so I'm not buying it. It's sitting in the box, it can sit there until I find the yarn and then I'll pick it up again. It's fine, kind of. The next project is a cowl and here is another bag that has been bought for me by a friend. I've had this one a few years and someone kindly commented on an earlier podcast that they had this bag that I'm about to show you and it reminded me that I have it. It is by Kelly Connor Designs and I feel that there's a lot that can be shown about a person by the gifts that their friends buy them. And how many of you have read that and the next line in your head has been, and I cannot lie? Or is that just me? Anyway, in here we have a cowl, which I'm calling the cowl of doom. I shouldn't, but I am, because this is the yarn that I've used four or five different time, times in different projects that haven't quite worked. 
And even when I thought, no, I'm going to make a cowl out of it, I managed to mess that up as well. I had an idea for a lacy cowl, which is still on the back burner, but not for this yarn. As you can see, there's quite a lot of contrast in it. It's a hedgehog fibres yarn. And that grey, uh, that beige colour creates quite a contrast. So it just looked really messy when I tried to put lace on it. So I'm going fairly plain. I'm doing rows of stocking stitch, reverse stocking stitch, and the grey, the beige is kind of flashing up through it. So I think that will look quite effective, but not too messy. So we're nearly there. Um, I'm doing some squares on a pin loom. I'll show you that another time because that's very early in its gestation period. And the final knitted project, there's not much crochet on the go at the moment, I need to sort that out. But the final knitted project is a cardigan for my sister. And in episode one, I was wearing a blue cardigan with navy trimmings, which I'd made for my sister. She then lost weight, so she gave it back to me. She has now finally decided, because I've been saying to her ages, I'd like to make you a replacement, it seems only fair. Um, she's now decided that she does want one. So we're going for a very similar thing. It's a zip-up jacket with a collar, cables down the front. Again, I'll go into more details when I talk about the project at length in a later episode. But this is as far as I've got at the moment. This is Debbie Bliss Rialto Aran. And the navy blue is Drops Big Merino. And I think I have enough of this to do the whole garment without the contrast, I'm reluctant to say collar and cuffs, rib, I'm not sure that's any better, um, yeah without the contrast but that's what she wants and the customer is always right especially when she's your big sister. So that's where we are, so not very far progressed with that one but it will be soon. So that's the Roundup of wood. Right, we're coming towards the end of another month. I think I've used up about 1,200 metres this month, which is good. Um, this, I don't think you've seen before, this is Venus Tips Up with Shoulder Shaping by Diane Conroy. And it's quite an unusual shaped quite an unusually shaped shawl but it does fit very well because of these pieces that go over the shoulder so here we go it's one of those days where it's a bit miserable so need a little something warm and cozy anyway <laughs> moving on the giveaways the giveaways the giveaways there will be two very similar the first one is on Ravelry and what I'd be grateful if people could do is just put a little note about the oldest yarn in their stash and why they haven't used it. Just curious, you know, did they buy it with a particular project in mind and that didn't happen or was it given to them by someone else? Just really interested in people's stash makeup. The prize doesn't go to the oldest, the prize will be picked out uh, at random from the, the comments received. But just thought it'd be interesting to know how people's stash is made up and, and what the oldest stuff is. The prize for that is three balls of yarn, which I picked up at the Fibre Festival. And it's by Isle Inspired Yarn. They're quite small balls. They are about 100 metres. And we've got three of these. And they are naturally dyed yarns with onion skins dyed with onion skins, obviously not onion skins in the yarns, that would be an interesting knit. Um, she had a lovely range of colours actually, my favourite was her red, but it was made out of cochineal and I thought, oh if there are vegetarians on, cochineal isn't a vegetarian product, and I thought this was a, a nice bright, as we approach summer, in the northern hemisphere at least, summery colour, so three balls of that. You'll also have one of my handmade, if you can see that, Combined Progress Keepers and Stitch Markers. That one's a little pretty tear. Uh, we also have in here, I'm making up a little bundle of things, a little notebook 
um, fabric covered notebook by Gemma Textiles, who's a lady I actually met at our knitting group many years ago, although she concentrates more on sewing. And also rummaging in the bag, some Romney Marsh Wool's shampoo. I hope it doesn't mean you smell like a sheep afterwards. I'm sure it won't. It'll all be lovely. I will put some sweet treats in as well. I'll get those near the time. So that's the Ravelry giveaway. The YouTube giveaway, very similar. This time, she said throwing things around. Excuse I. This time, Romney Marsh walls. And we have two balls of their light grey double knitting, double knitting weight. Uh, yes, pure British Romney lambs wool. What more could a girl want? Uh, you also, or a man, again, non-gender specific. Another one of my stitch marker come progress keepers. This one is a peace sign. Love and peace to all. Another of Gemma's fabric covered notebooks. This time the little bottle is of woolly wash. So a little something for your hand knits rather than your own hair. And again I'll find a little sweet treat for that. Um, now what I would like people to comment on on that, and this would be on YouTube comments, is to tell me about, it's all about me, to tell me about their earliest stash memories. I remember my, both of my grandmothers were excellent crafters. My maternal grandmother, very good at Aaron knitting, did very fine crochet work and she taught me to crochet. My paternal grandmother taught me the pearl stitch. My mum was left handed so she taught me the knit stitch but I couldn't grasp pearl from her because um, I was just trying to work it the other way around so my paternal grandmother taught me. She was a very keen knitter of things for jumble sales and bazaars so lots of toys and dolls and that sort of thing. I have her pattern books which I will um, show you in a later episode because they're good fun to look at but the reason why she's coming to mind when I think about early stash memories is I remember I was probably about 10 and she had a big dustbin bag of yarn it was all in a tangle it was all muddled up and I was staying with her one evening and she said well whatever you pull out of that you can keep and I had this lovely evening pulling out bits of yarn untangling and having these little balls of yarn for me to play with and I look back on that and two thoughts come to mind firstly that it's a really fond memory of a connection between the generations we didn't always get along brilliantly well um, you get that conflict as you get old and horrible when you're a teenager um, but it's a lovely memory of my grandmother and my other main thought on that is her entire stash fitted into one dustbin bag of yarn amateur both giveaways I hope your memories are better than mine uh, both giveaways will close on Friday the 25th of May so that's when I'll lock down the threads draw a line on them and I will draw them the last weekend of May as I record the last bit of next month's podcast. So good luck if you're entering. And I think that's about it for this month. It uh, feels like it's been quite a long podcast this month, so I hope it's not too long for you. Thanks again for watching. Thanks to everyone who's commented, subscribed, liked. Please feel free to do the same this month. Comment, like, subscribe, whatever you'd like to do. Um, I will try and respond to all comments um, that I get and answer any questions. Some questions I, may, I might sort of defer for another podcast, others I'll answer there and then. And please do enter the giveaways. I can't put this yarn in my stash, I'm not allowed this year. So please do enter the giveaways, I look forward to sending them on to someone. Thanks for spending your time with me. Have a great month and may everything you work on bring you joy, happiness, satisfaction and all good things. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.